Social media has sparked an inaccurate narrative of the efficacy and safety of TPA and stroke. This is Bill. Bill's a construction worker. During his lunch break at work one day, Bill noticed that he was having trouble drinking his coffee or holding his sandwich. When he tried to speak to tell a colleague that something was wrong, his words came out garbled. He was urgently brought to hospital and treated with TPA. Bill made a full recovery. This is Lucille. Lucille's an 81-year-old retired librarian who lives to spoil her grandchildren. She awoke one morning, unable to move her right arm or leg. When she was found by her husband, she was brought to hospital. She was not eligible for thrombolysis and was left with severe residual deficits, now requiring assistance with daily living. This is Roy. Roy loves the Toronto Maple Leafs, and he's an avid hockey fan. His wife found him one evening in their basement, confused, unresponsive, and having difficulty moving. He was urgently brought to hospital and underwent mechanical thrombectomy, leading to a large improvement, and after a brief stay in hospital, an eventual return home. This is Jolene. Jolene's favorite hobby is running. She noticed her hand wasn't working well one evening after a run and figured that she must just be tired. When it still wasn't functioning well the next day, however, she presented to the emergency department. It was there that she was identified to have had a small stroke the previous evening. She's doing well in outpatient stroke rehab. This is Yvonne. Yvonne's wheelchair bound from a remote injury, but is very involved in her local community. One morning, her left arm became weak, prompting her to call EMS. She was treated with TPA and had a modest improvement, but now has some residual weakness in her left arm and requires occasional help at home. Stroke represents a wide spectrum of disease across a diverse collection of patients and can have devastating implications. It needs no introduction. But its management warrants discussion, especially when there are those arguing that one of our mainstays of therapy is hurting our patients rather than helping them. My name is Doran Drew, I'm one of the fourth year emergency medicine residents here at the University of Ottawa, and I would like to welcome you to my talk, Thrombolytics, A Stroke of Luck. I feel quite privileged to be able to give you this talk today. I welcome both the neurology as well as the emergency medicine group here at the Ottawa Hospital. I welcome our community partners from across our Lynn. And I'd also like to welcome those joining us from across the country, those in Kingston, Toronto, Calgary, and Iqaluit. I'm excited by your interest in this very important topic, and I'm thankful to bring it to you with expertise that's been shared with me from both emergency physicians and stroke neurologists from across the country. I'd also like to make a special shout out to my supervisor for this talk, Dr. Miguel Cortel. And so drawing on that expertise, I'd like to start by making you a promise. A promise that by the end of this hour, you'll have a clearer picture of the past, the present, and the future of thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke. To do this, over the course of this talk, I will review the formative literature of our current TPA time window. I'll address the controversies around thrombolysis, as well as discuss its future. To start, I'd like to draw a parallel of the development of thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke to its use in myocardial infarction, one that has been honed and refined over decades of research. In fact, it's easy for us to lose sight of just how refined those criteria have become. It requires the right patient, with the specific clinical and electrocardiographic findings. And as we literally look downstream, it really shouldn't come to us as any surprise that the role of lytics in acute ischemic stroke is as, if not more nuanced, than that of myocardial infarction. Now, I'm gonna pause for a moment to be a little bit meta. There's literature to suggest that use of props as well as use of shorter durations of speaking in a talk, help with information retention. And I really want you to retain as much as possible from this talk. So given that, over the course of the talk, I'll be intermittently presenting you with some imagery and asking for participation. You can do this over the mic or using the chat, whatever is more comfortable for you. The purpose of this is largely to shake off any cobwebs and keep things interesting. With that said, does anyone recognize the cover of this book? 
So Dr. Sampson nailed it. This is Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. This is a classic. This is a book about duality, contrast, and similarities. And I bring it up because I think it's important to stroll back in history and review the story of thrombolysis as it came to be before we address its controversies. After myriad case series and smaller prospective studies suggesting benefit for thrombolytics, but an unclear overall data pool, the early 90s heralded the beginning of thrombolytics RCTs. The first of which was the Mass Italy trial. This trial ultimately went on to be stopped early due to concerns of harm, but the overall six month data at that time sparked more questions than it answered. Disability was halved, yet fatality seemed nearly doubled. This was a therapy that was going to need further study. Shortly thereafter came the ECAS-1 trial. This was the first TPA trial. It was a double-blinded RCT of 620 patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke within six hours. Now, I wanna talk for a moment about how they analyzed their data in this trial, because I think it's really important. They did an intention to treat model, which is a quick reminder, that's essentially the standard. Patients were analyzed as they were randomized, regardless of what they actually got. But they also did a modified intention to treat analysis. And this often draws a wary eye. What this essentially implies is that after having collected the data, there were subsets of patients that they excluded. This is often criticized because it leads to more bias in the study. But when we look to it in this particular study, I think it reveals something interesting. You see, there was a high incidence of major protocol violations in the study, 17.5% to be exact. And the majority of these related to patients being enrolled in the study who should not have been included in the first place. As you can imagine, this disproportionately would affect the TPA arm of the study. If a more established stroke was included and received a placebo, not much dangerous is gonna happen. But if that patient then went on to receive TPA, that might diminish any signs of benefit and worsen signals of harm. With respect to their primary outcome, looking at functional independence, they did not find a difference with respect to their intention to treat model. There was no statistical significance. And while you might argue that there might be a clinically relevant benefit there, this was a negative outcome. However, with respect to this modified intention to treat analysis, with respect to this explanatory analysis, they found statistical significance and they found a sign of benefit. When we look towards death, we see that the intention to treat model had a larger amount of mortality in the TPA arm and it was approaching statistical significance. However, when we look at the modified arm, we see this become more marginal and a movement away from statistical significance. So why did this happen? Was this because the authors needed a positive result and were fudging their data? I'd offer an alternative explanation. I think this happened because people had hope. Physicians were hopeful that this disabling disease with which they'd been dealing would be potentially managed by this new drug coming out. The ECAS-1 trial highlighted that physicians weren't yet able to correctly identify who would benefit from the drug, but it showed that the drug worked. And I think this is a really formative study that's very easy to gloss over if you don't look at the details. Later that year, will come a trial that will be familiar to many of you. This is the NINS trial. It was an RCT looking at TPA administration within three hours of symptom onset. This is a positive study. They found a statistically significant 13% absolute difference for minimal or no disability in those who received TPA. That's the number needed to treat of eight. With respect to symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, they found a 6% absolute difference as compared with placebo. Mortality was similar in the study, although if anything, it favored the TPA arm doing better with a 4% difference. Thus, this positive trial was essentially the birth of the three hour TPA time window. Following the NINS trial and such promising results, two more trials looking at streptokinase, the first agent we talked about, came out. They were the MAST Italy trial and the ASK trial. The first of these 
the MAST EU trial to follow the NINS trial, looked at patients with moderate to severe strokes in a MCA distribution only. There was a time window of up to six hours and a median time to presentation of four and a half hours. They found increased early mortality with statistical significance and a very clinically concerning trend towards statistical significance at six months. Rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage were very elevated at 20% absolute increase with the, in those who received TPA. And when it came to their primary outcome, there was essentially no difference. It's probably no surprise to you that this trial was stopped early. Its Australian counterpart, the ASK trial, had similar findings. Patients that received streptokinase at three month follow-up did worse. When they tried to separate the frequency of mortality based on a time window, those who received it later seemed to do worse, but even those who received it early weren't exactly doing well. Rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage were increased, and this led to a lot of thinking. Was this agent just the problem? Were all thrombolytics an issue? Could there be some subset of people that would benefit from streptokinase? That might be valued to some members of society. And ultimately, the primary outcome of this study was negative. It showed equivalence. And this was the end of streptokinase in acute ischemic stroke. With three now very negative streptokinase trials, all eyes were drawn to TPA. In 1998, the ECAS-2 trial was published in The Lancet. This is a study looking to verify the findings of NINs and potentially expand the suggested window for thrombolysis. This study of 800 patients looking at both zero to three and three to six hour time points had an ambitious primary outcome. They dichotomized patients to excellent or poor outcomes. For perspective, patients who were able to look after their own affairs with no assistance, but were not able to do everything that they previously did were considered a bad outcome. This is the glass half full study and their optimistic primary outcome would ultimately limit generalizability. With respect to that excellent outcome, they found a 3.7% 3 absolute benefit towards TPA, but it was not statistically significant. When they broke this down by time window, it didn't seem much different. When they extended their analysis, however, to more good outcomes, patients who had some disability but were able to retain their independence, they found an absolute benefit for TPA with statistical significance. The issue with this was this wasn't even a secondary outcome. This was something that the authors found when analyzing the data after the fact. In their credit, they emphasize this. And while it's reassuring from a methodology perspective, it's something that we would need to be cautious with. Rates of intracranial hemorrhage were similar to those seen in the NINS trial, and there was no difference in mortality. The findings of the ECAS-2 trial in retrospect aren't really all that surprising. Strokes were less severe in this study, leaving us with less room to identify improvement, and the majority of patients presented later than the NINS trial. This wasn't a trial that was designed in a way such that it could replicate the NINS trial, and it shouldn't be viewed as such. Nonetheless, the equipoise of this trial would be a match to kindling that were the three negative streptokinase trials. Skeptics would argue that the data was tortured, whereas TPA advocates would provide a different interpretation, arguing that while the study was underpowered to verify the findings in the NINS trial, that the tertiary findings, or that of the good patient outcomes, provided some practical patient-centered data. Ultimately, perseverance would be required. Now, it's been about 10 minutes since the last little interruption, so just take a moment, step away from the rigors of research, and I wanna reference a different feat of humanity. I'm wondering if anyone recognizes this photo, this structure. Um, and to give you a hint, this is located in Barcelona, Spain. Yeah, people nailed it. Awesome. That's absolutely correct. Uh, so this is the photo I took 
when travel was still a thing. And religious associations aside, the structure is incredible. It's a testament to human perseverance and has maintained progression towards completion over 139 years. It's been survived by three architects and despite war and strife is still ongoing. And on that note of perseverance, I wanna take you into deep waters as I talk about the Atlantis A and B trials. The Atlantis B trial published in 1999 was a North American study looking at 547 patients treated between three and five hours after symptom onset. They were interested in excellent neurological outcomes, specifically individuals with an NIH score of zero or one at 90 days. They found no difference. And that difference wasn't just for the excellent outcomes. It extended across severities of disability. But there was definitely still a signal of harm. There was statistically significant increases in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage and an arguably clinically relevant and concerning increase in mortality. The Atlantis B trial was ultimately stopped early due to futility, but it's not unreasonable to suspect that if the trial hadn't been stopped due to futility, that it would have gone on to be stopped due to safety. This was the first negative TPA trial and argued against the expansion beyond the existing treatment window of three hours. The Atlantis A trial, the counterpart to the Atlantis B trial, looked to evaluate TPA administration across multiple time windows between zero and six hours. Now, one nuance of this trial was that they included more advanced strokes. They included individuals with CT findings that had previously been excluded from stroke trials. I think that's an important consideration as we go forward. With respect to good outcomes, with respect to patients who had a four point or greater improvement on their NIH stroke scale at 30 day follow up relative to when they presented, they found a 15% absolute difference that was statistically significant. The problem was that difference favored the placebo arm. This was the nosedive. And this trial ultimately went on to be stopped early as the safety data monitoring board had major concerns about those being treated in the five to six hour time window. They had a staggering increase of an absolute increase in mortality of 32% and an 18% increase in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages. Now to explore this a little bit, patients who were allocated to, the, to TPA in this time group had more severe strokes just due to chance. And as a result of that, it's difficult to say how much of this effect is just the natural history of more severe strokes, how much of it is the result of thrombolizing completed infarctions, and how much of it is some combination of the two. But what we can say is that the five to six hour subgroup drove the findings for the total population here. And what they found was an increase in mortality and an increase in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage that many would find unacceptable. Ultimately, at this point in time, expansion of the three hour treatment window seemed unlikely. Where ECAS 2 was lighting a match for skeptics of TPA, the Atlantis trials were kerosene. It wouldn't be until eight years later when the ECAS 3 trial was published that a TPA time window beyond three hours was once again up for discussion. This trial looked exclusively at strokes between the three and four and a half hour period. They had a focus on, a, on an excellent neurological outcome as their primary outcome. This was a positive trial. Not only did they find a 7% absolute benefit that was statistically significant, but this benefit seemed to extend across severities of disability. Rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, while elevated, were slightly lower than previous studies and mortality seemed no different. The ECAS-3 trial presented impressively positive data with a reassuring safety profile. And this led to advocacy for an expansion of the thrombolysis treatment window based on modest but evident improvement for the patients that received this therapy. The authors concluded their manuscript with something that I think resonates with both neurologists as well as emergency physicians. Having more time does not mean we should be allowed to take more time. In 2012, 
four years after the ECAS-3 trial, the IST-3, or the Third International Stroke Trial, would be published. This pragmatic, international, multi-center study looked to enroll a large sample size and identify once and for all if TPA really did improve long-term independence in stroke patients across a period of six hours. This trial was a little bit different from those that had proceeded in two major ways. One, it wasn't blinded, and two, they included patients over the age of 80 where the elderly previously had been excluded. Up front, this trial was victim to some tinkering. The first study protocol was powered to find a, a difference as small as 3% in disability between groups. To do that, they would need a population of about 6,000 patients. Seven years into the study, when they were less than halfway there, they decided that this target would be halved to expedite the study conclusion. An additional amendment was later made, adding in an ordinal analysis, that is looking at the impact of a therapy across severities of disability, because this had become something of an in vogue way of representing therapy impact in stroke trials. A perhaps modest trend towards benefit was seen, but without statistical significance. But on that ordinal analysis, on that view across the areas of disability that was added in to the protocol late, they did find a small benefit, and it was statistically significant. Rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage were similar to that seen in the NINS trial, and mortality seemed no different. Where the IST3 trial sought to give us a definitive answer to whether TPA was better or not, it seemed to give us more of the same without that decisive answer we were seeking. It also muddied waters further by including the elderly, the previous mantra that they would be unlikely to benefit from TPA was called into question. And in fact, they seemed to do better. Additionally, their findings didn't really support the idea of time is brain. And it made some begin to, to question the entire idea of thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke. So let's recap. Let's go over the story and the data we have so far, step by step. First was the ECAS-1 trial, between zero and six hours, and it showed a benefit in those treated strictly by the protocol. Following that was the NINS trial, a truly positive study. Third was the ECAS-2 trial, with promising results, but ultimately limited by its optimism. Fourth was the Atlantis B trial, this argued against any benefit beyond three hours. And subsequently, the Atlantis A trial argued against any benefit at all, although this was largely driven by that five to six hour cohort. The ECAS-3 trial gave us reassuring data in the three to four and a half hour time window, balancing the findings of the Atlantis B and A trials. And the IST-3 trial, while its primary outcome did not reach statistical significance, gave us a reassuring safety profile and some further signal that this drug might work. And when summarized like this, I think you might be able to appreciate why, despite this being a very bumpy road, a four and a half hour time window was ultimately decided upon as safe. So on the topic of traveling bumpy roads, I'm wondering if anyone knows what the origin of shaking hands was. Yeah, you've all been great. Um, it, it, that's exactly it. Um, I think Yang got to it first. It was for travelers crossing paths in contrary directions to reveal they bore no weapons and intended no harm to one another. And as your minds settle in on thoughts of peace, I'll step into the controversy. I've presented you with our current time window and I've highlighted the existing evidence. What if someone came along and told you that NINs and ECAS-3 were wrong. Would you still believe in TPA with no trials satisfying their primary outcomes? These concerns were those that were raised following the Hoffman and Alper reanalyses of these two respective landmark trials. 
Uptake and discussion of these reanalyses has been fervent on social media. How many people cared? How good were the reanalyses? Was this just an outspoken few physicians, or were there many that were concerned? The answer to the latter question was seemingly this was a lot of people. A BMJ survey found that 54% of respondents were actually opposed to thrombolytics. Things were out of control. This controversy wasn't just politics south of the border. This was raging across the globe. It was even featured in our very own CGEM in 2020 with a debate series between Dr. Ken Milne and Dr. Eddie Lang. For those of you who don't know them, Dr. Lang is a senior scientist emergency physician stationed in Calgary, and Dr. Milne is the founder of the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine and a key voice in the Canadian community. Both are highly respected individuals and embody a focus on evidence-based ev medicine. The points made by Dr. Milne in his position against thrombolysis are better founded and better articulated than much of what is brought up in the anti-TPA discourse on social media. And so these are the arguments I'll explore and these are the arguments I'll address. The first argument is that the graphic reanalysis of the NINS trial by Hoffman et al. in Annals of Emergency Medicine presents evidence that the effective TPA disappears when patient's NIAH score is accounted for. Presented here is a figure from that paper. And I think if you look at it, it argues against that point. The green line represents TPA, and you can see that it is lower on the graph than the blue line, which represents placebo. The lower the score, if you look at the y-axis, the less disability a patient had. There are a few interesting things about this figure, which I do want to highlight. The difference is still present, albeit much smaller, in those at higher baseline NIH stroke scores. And this is consistent with our current understanding of the physiology, which wasn't present at the, at the inception of the NINS trial. We know that higher stroke scores are more frequently associated with a more proximal thrombus. For example, an internal carotid artery or a proximal MCA stroke. And from Menon et al's findings in 2018, we know that these patients benefit less from TPA. Whereas more distal MCA clots, for example, have much higher recanalization rates. Thankfully for these patients, for this cohort of individuals, we now have thrombectomy as an option for those with proximal clots. When we look at the other end of the spectrum, we see one area where placebo seemed to outperform TPA, and that's at low stroke severities. So thus, I think a more accurate interpretation of this figure would be that the NINS trial seems to suggest that TPA is beneficial across a breadth of stroke severities, but that in those with less disabling strokes, it's unclear if that benefit is maintained. And this is a question that was recently sought to be answered in the form of the PRISMS trial. There's a 2018 trial that looked at this exact question. In stroke patients with minor deficits presenting within three hours, was alteplase as compared with aspirin beneficial? The trial, unfortunately, ran into issues with funding and was stopped early. But of those patients that it was able to collect, which is 313, they didn't find a statistically significant difference. And in fact, a small signal to maybe these patients did worse with TPA. And again, they saw an increase in the rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. To more satisfactorily answer this question, there's currently a Canadian study ongoing called the TEMPO2 study, which is hoped to be published in the next few years. The second argument presented is that the time is brain paradigm disappears following readjustment of baseline characteristics in the NINS trial. Moreover, it's posited that the data I showed you earlier from the IST3 trial also argues against the idea of time as brain. This argument calls into question the entire idea of an ischemic penumbra. And while both of these individual points were observed, the best explanation for this is that neither of these studies were adequately powered to assess this question. This meta-analysis, which, which I reference here, however, was. With a sample size of 3,670 patients, they were able to clearly show that the earlier a patient is treated with TPA, the greater the benefit they achieve. And that up to a time point of four and a half hours, there's a statistically significant benefit with a reasonable number needed to treat. When the safety of TPA is called into question, 
I would reference the SITSMO study. There's a large registry study looking at those who received TPA within three hours. They compared their findings to the pooled placebo arms of the existing stroke thrombolysis RCTs. Specifically, they found 15% greater functional independence, a consistent rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, similar to that of the NINS trial, and about a 6% lower, lower mortality at the time of follow-up. And while from a methodologic perspective, comparison between an aggregate placebo arm and the findings of a registry study isn't the most robust thing, it does articulate ongoing support and safety for TPA. This was done in Europe. When we extend our lens outside of Europe, when we look to the cases and the STARS studies, which were run out of Canada and the United States, we find similar things. Next, the ALPER paper highlighted some vulnerabilities of the ECAS-3 study. This is the study which gave us our three to four and a half hour time window. In adjusting for baseline imbalances between arms and re-examining the data using a number of statistical methods, they found that statistical significance for benefit was lost in the majority of the forms of analysis, while harm-related outcomes were maintained. While a reanalysis of the data, and this is emphasized by the authors, cannot change the trial outcome, they highlighted that it can change our certainty around it. This argument is very well taken. And if the ECAS-3 trial was the only data we had supporting a four and a half hour time window, I think it would be absolutely imperative that we reevaluate this. It would be remiss not to. But fortunately, that's not the case. I present to you the best data we have on TPA. This is an individual patient data meta-analysis of all, which is an aggregate of all the existing RCTs on TPA. This is a study of nearly 7,000 patients. And we see a 10% absolute benefit to those treated within three hours and a 5% absolute benefit to those treated within four and a half hours with respect to excellent outcomes. The outcomes we offer our patients by treating them within four and a half hours are modest, yet they're substantial. And as said in the ECAS-3 trial, the faster we move, the better our patients do. A key point highlighted in this meta-analysis is that the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage was about 5%, similar to what had been seen in previous trials. But this didn't seem to change with time. And it highlights that this is a relatively static risk. And thus, when we treat our stroke patients, it is literally a race against time because the benefit is a profile of diminishing returns, whereas the profile of harm is one that's relatively fixed. With respect to mortality, the meta-analysis found no statistically significant difference in either of the time windows. And while this therapy isn't perfect, I think it's clear that the benefits outweigh the risks. And thus I come to the last major argument against thrombolysis. That is the articulation that most of the trials were negative, that were being deceived by heterogeneous populations being molded into something positive by statistical wizardry. And this argument being made is substantiated by reference to the meta-analysis referenced here by Donaldson et al. And it argues that more trials are needed in order to more clearly illuminate the safety of thrombolysis. This meta-analysis concludes that there is clear evidence of increased early mortality, increased rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, and also of improved functional outcomes for patients with presumed acute ischemic stroke who are treated with thrombolysis. The limitation of this conclusion lies in how thrombolysis was defined. Definition is critical, and we know that what matters most is having the right agent in the right place at the right time. Thrombolysis, as defined here, represents literally any agent used in a trial between the dawn of time and the publication of this paper, regardless of if it's even still available in the 21st century. My concern is that this is the comparison of apples and oranges. As I've already highlighted earlier, streptokinase, for instance, while a thrombolytic agent was not beneficial, is not used anymore, and nor should it be. 
The same goes for the majority of the nonspecific thrombolytics included in this meta-analysis. And thus this begs the question, what did they find when they looked at just TPA? What did they find when they looked at just the oranges? And what they found is robustly shown statistical significance, suggesting benefit for our patients in the form of increased independence and an equivocal result for mortality. The paper concludes arguing against thrombolysis and referencing the idea of primum non nocere, that first, as physicians, we should do no harm. And so I would ask, when their own analysis highlights benefit for TPA with no increase in mortality, would withholding such a therapy not violate this very principle? So let's go back to the timeline. We've established lysis up to four and a half hours is safe. What about beyond that? Many of our patients, with some studies quoting as high as 90% of them, fall outside of that time window. The wake-up strokes, the late presenters. How do we push the agenda forward in those that fall in that window? Those that fall in that window and aren't amenable to mechanical thrombectomy? The answer to that question might be perfusion imaging guided thrombolysis. Four trials attempted to address this by moving beyond a time-based cutoff and using perfusion imaging to identify TPA candidates. The first of these was the wake-up trial in May of 2018. The second was the ECAS-4 trial in March of 2019. The third was the EXTEND trial in May of 2019. And the fourth was the THAWS trial in May of 2020. Unfortunately, recruitment issues would stymie a clear answering of this question. The wake-up trial was stopped early due to funding issues, and the ECAS-4 trial was stopped due to slow recruitment. ECAS-4 would go on to be a negative study. The wake-up trial, however, would show to statistically significant benefit. And as a result of this benefit being shown, both the EXTEND and the THAWS trial were stopped early by the data safety monitoring boards as it was felt that there was a loss of clinical equipoise. They were left with two positive trials and two negative trials, all of which were underpowered to, find, to answer their outcomes. Which brings us back to the hero of the story of the stroke literature, and that is the individual patient data meta-analysis and systematic review. Published in this past year, all of the authors collaborated to compile this individual patient level data and meta-analyze what were essentially four partial trials. With a sample size of 843 patients and a median time to treatment from last seen well of 10 and a half hours, their results made the future look promising for wake-up strokes. They found improved rates of excellent outcomes with an improvement of 8% that was statistically significant and benefit that seemed to extend across severities of disability. Rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage were elevated as compared to placebo, but similar to what was seen in previous windows. And benefit, conversely, was seemingly balanced by a small yet statistically significant increase in mortality. And I think that's concerning to a lot of people. But one thing that the authors adroitly pointed out was that when looking at a composite outcome of death or dependence, there was a benefit that was statistically significant favoring TPA. And this brings up two different observations, neither is right or wrong, but I think that warrant discussion of what would our patients value more. I think this is something that'll probably vary on a case by case basis, but to many, complete dependence is not necessarily preferable to dying. Ultimately, I think this data is promising. I think it hints at a future of stroke care where decisions are tailored to individuals. With that said, this literature isn't without its limitations. The number of patients presenting late in their stroke, but with still viable brain tissue, isn't clearly known, and we'll need further epidemiologic studies to answer this. I suspect that it's actually relatively infrequent, 
just based on the fact that these studies all faced pretty significant recruitment issues. But we'll need something dedicated to answer this question more clearly to identify how much healthcare resource would be needed for what amount of benefit. Additionally, as we look at a more Canadian context, the predominance of MRI perfusion studies included in this meta-analysis compared to CT perfusion studies, I think limit the immediate generalizability of this to our healthcare system. While CT perfusion studies were included in this meta-analysis, I would wanna see a study with a, at least a very significant proportion of CT perfusion imaging before this was rolled out broadly across Canada. Regardless though, this study hints at a promising future for individualized stroke care and adds to an impressive body of work that has already been put towards giving our patients the best outcomes possible. It hints at increased solutions for patients presenting with wake-up strokes. And it also highlights the potential in the future for optimizing identification of patients who won't benefit from TPA, even if they are within our time window, patients who serve only to be harmed by the administration of lytics. Stroke world's exciting right now. In addition to these studies related to perfusion-guided imaging, perfusion-guided thrombolysis rather, there's numerous studies currently underway looking at other, answering other questions, looking towards tenecteplase as the possible alternative lytic agent, given perhaps a more favorable safety profile. Additionally, stroke researchers are currently looking for an answer as to the role of lytics perithrombectomy. Will it go the way of thrombolysis in MI and fall to the wayside in favor of the equivalent to PCI? Or will it serve to facilitate or enhance the impact of thrombectomy? On this positive, forward-thinking note, I want to circle back to my initial objectives and the promise that I made you at the start of this talk. It's my hope that you feel your current understanding of the thrombolysis time window has been augmented by this presentation, that you're better informed and equipped to address the controversies as you encounter them, and that you have a greater appreciation of ongoing areas of development related to thrombolytics in acute ischemic stroke. Essentially, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I hope that you have a clear picture of the endeavors of the past, the present, and the future of thrombolysis. I'll welcome any questions now.